Mr. Speaker, sir, I rise and beg leave of this Honorable House to make the following statement. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Members, earlier this month, the 21st of March to be exact, I celebrated 23 years as an elected representative of the people of my beloved country. I use this opportunity, sir, to congratulate two other honorable members, member for St. Christopher VI and member for Nevis X, who also celebrated in like manner. I give thanks to the Almighty God for his guidance, sustenance, and manifold blessings on my life. Mr. Speaker, I am eternally grateful to the people of constituency number three for the confidence reposed in me, in fact, for the love and unwavering support they have showered on me throughout the years, and even more so in these challenging times. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, I've been blessed to have had the support and encouragement of the nation as I endeavored to serve my people and country in a fair, just, and truthful manner at all times. I am fully of the view, Mr. Speaker, that the critical responsibility, duty, if you like, of an elected representative is to promote and protect the interests of our country and people everywhere. And in doing so, I've undertaken at all times to be accessible, transparent, accountable, and above all, to be faithful and true to my people, to myself, and to my God. Mr. Speaker, I believe that I have an obligation to address a matter of national importance pertaining to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for which I have legal and constitutional responsibility. I speak, Mr. Speaker, of the establishment of a consulate in the United Arab Emirates, or what is now known as the Dubai Consular Affair. Sir, this matter has been in the public domain for the last two weeks or so, and rightly so, since the establishment of an embassy or consulate is the public's business. I believe, therefore, Mr. Speaker, that it is important to give for the information and education and edification of the general public a short synopsis of the procedure and protocol involved in the establishment of a consulate or embassy for that matter. In the first place, this is a function of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and as such, the cabinet submission for the establishment of the office must emanate from the Foreign Affairs Ministry. A decision to establish a consulate or embassy can originate from cabinet. The implementation and operational functions, however, must be undertaken by the line ministry, in this case, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <coughs> I said to the country through this honorable house, that since assuming the portfolio as Minister of Foreign Affairs in February 2010, I have not had discussions or presentation either at estimates committee meeting, cabinet meeting, or budget debate regarding the establishment of the said consulate. Mr. Speaker, when I heard through public discussions of a proposed establishment of a consulate in Dubai, I said to myself, something fishy about this. I immediately asked the present permanent secretary to investigate the matter and to report back to me. In fact, when I spoke to this matter earlier, I said that I had discussed with the permanent secretary in late January. He has since indicated that, that, that I had requested the investigation in early February. It was on March 13th that I received a memo from the, from the Permanent Secretary dated 12th March 
informing me of travel plans as part of a three-person delegation from March 14th through 23rd to finalize arrangements to establish a consulate in Dubai. <coughs> the delegation, according to the PS communique, was himself the PS in the Prime Minister's office and a consul general designate. Mr. Speaker, the appointment of a consul general must be done after consultation with the foreign minister and surely after interviews with a short list of candidates. There are a number of persons working in the ministry who have qualified themselves for further advancement in this field of work, who have repeatedly raised concerns regarding the manner in which overseas assignments are made. We must, Mr. Speaker, at all times insist on making this process as transparent as possible, while we endeavor to give equal opportunity to qualified candidates. It is no surprise, therefore, Mr. Speaker, that this matter has caused such consternation and disagreement. For however one may wish to view this matter, it certainly does not speak to good communications, adherence to proper procedure, nor to good governance. Mr. Speaker, the actions taken gave me no opportunity as the minister accountable to this parliament for all expenditure within the ministry to praise the country of this significant and costly undertaking. It is quite clear, Mr. Speaker, that the issues, nuances, etc., are not lost on the public, on the general public, as there has been an avalanche of public debate and continued interest in these matters. And this is exactly how democracy is expected to work. We must remain accountable to our people. I gave an interview, having heard the press secretary to the Prime Minister advised the ministry, advised that the ministry would be the best place to get the information regarding the consulate in Dubai. I explained the situation exactly as I knew it. I left the island to attend an official meeting in Brussels the following day. And I thought that all was settled, but kept abreast of developments at home. Mr. Speaker, I learned that the matter was dealt with on the radio program, Ask the PM. A friend of mine texts me to say, Leroy Percival or Fishy, as he's called, on Ask the PM, mashing up boy, Sam, discrediting you. I replied by saying, Fishy probably forget that I'm a parliamentarian and have a national audience to defend myself. She responded by saying, well, doggy too, because he allowed all of it for about 15 minutes. Mr. Speaker, it has been said that it was allowed for up to 15, 16, 17 minutes, depending on who was taking the time. One person said, after 12 minutes when he was trying to stop, he went on for another five. But Mr. Speaker, that for me was a very unfortunate matter. And I am really, really disappointed that a matter like that could have been facilitated to try to discredit a minister of this government. It is because of competence and knowledge of good governance, care and attention to procedures and human resource, communication skills and genuine caring that have been able to gain the confidence and cooperation of people from every strata of society as we work together to develop our people and nation. In the final analysis, Mr. Speaker, Good leaders abhor wrongdoing of all kinds. Sound leadership has a moral foundation. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 12. The question must be asked, Mr. Speaker, whether or not the lack of openness and adherence to proper protocols and procedure, or the total disrespect shown to the ministry's responsibility, speaks to an act of divisiveness or whether the behavior demonstrated 
throughout speaks to unity and goodwill amongst colleagues and comrades. The record must show, Mr. Speaker, that I take great offense to the manner in which this whole episode is being played out. It is disrespectful, out of order, and unpardonable. Many ask on a daily basis, how is it possible to continue to in the face of all this? I conclude that the maker has his work plan. He has his work, he has his plan. And he has to work his plan. I am prayed up, Mr. Speaker. And when I say prayed up, I mean prayed up. Family, friends, and the nation, as I endeavor each day to understand his will for my life and for my country in general. I thank the many individuals and organizations for their prayerful support. Mr. Speaker, the country is hurting while we proceed apparently unconcerned and uncaring about the negative impact of all this on the social, political, and economic development of our native land. I say to our citizens, though, and through you, Mr. Speaker, and this honorable house, that it gives me absolutely no pleasure in making this statement, but I find myself duty-bound to do so. I pray that we will find the will and the way to continue to grow and prosper our country so that it will continue to be the beacon of hope that it has been. Mr. Speaker, my record as a Minister of Government speaks for itself. It has been nothing short of exemplary. Every ministry I've held, I've had performed, I have performed with distinction. I started in 1995, Mr. Speaker, in the Ministry of Trade, Industry, Youth, and Sports. The Warner Park facilities, my vision, with cricket and football coexisting. In fact, the original plan from the ministry was to have a 400-meter track. Later, it was decided to relocate the track at Birdwell. Just on Sunday, in one of the most successful athletic meets, officials were discussing my involvement in terms of the development of sports from that time. The programs and development of the office, the Department of Sports and the recruitment of all the disciplines in sporting activities. At the Ministry of Education, under my watch, we produced a green paper which, turned, which was turned into a white paper, which is a blueprint for education up to the year 2020. At Social Security, we have grown into a billion dollar enterprise, and we are undertaking a comprehensive Social Security reform which will redound to the benefit of all the members. Mr. Speaker, over the years I've been given increasingly responsible work to do, and I've done it all, whether it is as chairman of the electoral and boundaries and electoral constitution and electoral reform committee, or as the chairman of the 25th anniversary of the independence committee, and I've performed Mr. Speaker, with distinction. And so, my prayer, Mr. Speaker, is that this country will continue to grow and prosper, and that we will continue to be the, the beacon of hope that it has been. And may there ever be opportunities for the advancement of all our people. God be our guide and stay. May it please you, Mr. Speaker.